night or morning if you're watching it in the morning. Uh, welcome to an introduction to Milo Yiannopoulos. I am Steve Luckner. So let me just talk a little bit about what we're doing here today. So if you've been watching the news at all lately, you've probably been hearing this name a lot, Milo Yiannopoulos. And you might be wondering, uh, what's the deal with this guy? So you might have heard about him, well, he goes to speak at college campuses, but very often they're protesters and often he gets sh they shut down the speech. Uh, you might have heard he's controversial. Uh, you might have heard different things about him, like uh, he is a uh, gay, um, conservative, co controversial person. You might have heard that. Uh, you might have heard, actually, so uh, there were recently some ri like riots and protests at UC Berkeley where his speech got shut down. And in response to that, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom of California said uh, in, a, in a statement that, uh, among other things, that Milo Yiannopoulos is racist, misogynist, and white supremacist. So he's in the news. He's controversial. But when you see all this stuff in the news and discussion in the papers and everything in the media, one thing to me you don't see is what does he actually think? What are his actual views? And what I thought we could do here today as kind of just like a service to all of you, if you want to follow with the news and know what's going on, is the purpose of this is just to present a summary of the basic views of Milo Yiannopoulos. We are not endorsing the views. We are not uh, not, not endorsing the views. We're, this, this in no way is like taking a stance on these views. The purpose of this is that if you watch this video, you by the end of the video will have a much better idea on the basic things Milo Yiannopoulos believes and that in the sense of these are the things he's been saying in his speeches on college campuses, these are the things he's been saying in his prominent writings lately, and these are the things that supposedly all this controversy is about. And the goal here is for you to have uh, a more informed idea of what he believes so that if his name comes up in the news or his name comes up in a Facebook post you're reading or his name comes up in a discussion with your friends, uh, rather than people talking about Milo and not knowing anything he's talking about, uh, the discussion can be a bit more informed and uh, be based on what he actually thinks. So that's really the goal here. Uh, so, so hopefully if I do my job and explain everything clearly by the end of this video, you will uh, know better what Milo thinks about stuff. And if I could just say a quick thing to Micah, if you're hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of myself, so I don't know if you can turn the volume down where you're sitting, that would be awesome. Uh, thank you. So, to begin with, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, just in terms of who this guy is, uh, and I should say before, he is, he's a, he's a Breitbart, he's an editor at the site Breitbart, uh, which you might have heard of, which is a prominent website. And uh, Breitbart is also uh, the website where Steve Bannon, who's really big now in the Trump administration, used to work at. And uh, he is gay, and he's openly gay. So what else can I say about him? So those are some basic facts about him. You can look him up on the web if you want to get more bio information. But here we're going to focus on what his beliefs are. And if I wanted to uh, give an overall just initial statement about his beliefs, I'll say this. Uh, what he's generally been doing in his speeches the last couple of years on college campus, as I, and, I, and I, just so you know, I am getting this because the way I went about this, I didn't speak with Milo and I didn't say like, hey Milo, what do you want me to say about you? This entire uh, presentation today is just based on his published speeches, published interviews with him, uh, published videos, and I certainly have not watched every one of these, so I apologize if I leave something out. But this is after uh, watching a bunch of this stuff and, and reading a bunch of this stuff, um, just my distillation of what the key parts of his beliefs are. So I think one good starting point is to say that Milo, in his writings and speeches, very often has three targets in mind. His writings and speeches focus on three targets. The first one is Islam. And the general, we'll talk about each of these three targets more specifically, but the general, so, well, to, uh, let me name the three targets first. The three targets that he has most recently focused on are one is Islam, two is radical feminism, and three What's three? I have it written down here. 
Three is, can I even remember it? Well, that's what, that's what kind of video this is going to be. Three is, oh, Black Lives Matter. Those are the three he focuses on. And there's some other views which, after we go through those three, uh, I will touch on some of those other prominent things he says, uh, which don't really fall under one of those three. But that's really, those are the three things he's known for. So he's known for speeches and writings that uh, argue in opposition to Islam, radical feminism, and Black Lives Matter. And of course, uh, those might sound like really controversial topics to you, and they are, and he admits that. And uh, he will openly admit that he is talking about controversial topics that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially if, if you argue in opposition to them. But this is what he does. But those are the three he focuses on. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to go through each of one of those, and I'll give you a summary of his thoughts on each of those topics and why, what his arguments are against each of those three, what his basic ideas are. And I should say, if you want to learn more about him, hopefully at the end of this, if you want to learn more about him, I would highly encourage you to go read his speeches and watch his speeches and read his writings yourself. Because that's the real way to get to know what somebody thinks. This is just my distillation of what he thinks. And I think I'm getting pretty accurate here, but you really need to go to the source if you want to get 100% accurate. So I would, and there's lots of stuff I'm not covering. So I'm just giving you the basics as I see them. So I encourage you at the end to, uh, if you want to, go read more stuff. And actually, I will, as we're going through and at the end, uh, probably I'll focus on this at the end. I'll give you like a list of the different sources that I mainly used for this broadcast. So let's begin. As I said before, Milo Yiannopoulos, the three main targets of his are Islam, radical feminism, and Black Lives Matter. And let's, so let's begin by talking about, one, Milo Yiannopoulos' views on Islam. What's his problem with Islam? Why, is he, uh, why does he have objections to it? So uh, I would say one chief, one main point, an overarching point, if I had to think of what is the overarching point he makes about Islam when he gives his lectures about Islam and stuff. And I would say it's something like this. He thinks we need to be concerned about Islam and about the growth of Islam. Uh, he says that Islam is the, and oh, I should repeat before getting into this, all of this is just I'm giving you my take on his views. I am not, this is not an endorsement or a non-endorsement of his views. I won't be arguing for or against him. I'm just going to be presenting the views. Now let's begin going through the specific views. So on Islam, I think, uh, if you were to say, what is this chief point about Islam? I think the big point, his overarching point, is we need to be concerned as Americans about Islam. And I should say that, uh, so he is, a, he is not American citizen, he is from England, and uh, so you might argue that his arguments are supposed to apply to all like Western Europeans. But in general, when he writes, like when he gives speeches at college campuses, he talks about Americans. So I'm going to put these arguments in terms of applying to Americans. But I, I'm guessing he would apply the same, a lot of the same ones to people in England or Western Europe or wherever. So a uh, big point about Islam, overarching point that he makes, is that we need to be concerned about Islam. He says it's the fasting, gr fastest growing world religion. And he thinks we should be concerned about Islam growing because he thinks that Islam uh, has a viewpoint which in several ways is opposed to fundamental American values. So he thinks we really need to be concerned about the growth of Islam because in several ways it conflicts with values and beliefs that are very important to us as Americans. So what specifically are the ways that he thinks Islam conflicts with American values. Well, one overarching theme that he gives in his writings and speeches is that Islam restricts personal freedoms. He says that repeatedly. Islam restricts personal freedoms, and he gives examples of it. And that conflicts with our American value of liberty and people having certain freedoms. So, for example, he says, uh, he talks a lot about how Islam, in his view, enslaves women. So, he gives specific examples of this. He talks about how Islam it restricts what women wear, um, it forces women into marriages, he, it, uh, it calls for genital mutilation, uh, it overall makes women be submissive to men. And he also will say stuff like, um, he thinks, so as we're going to get into, he is very critical of radical, what he calls radical feminism. But he thinks that because he is willing to criticize Islam, 
but a lot of feminists are not willing to criticize Islam. He, he would say he's more of a feminist than the feminists are because he thinks Islam in, such, in so many ways restricts the freedom of women. So that is one way in which he thinks Islam conflicts with American values. Uh, another way he thinks Islam conflicts with American values is it restricts personal freedoms. So he gives examples of this. He talks about how Islam has rules against smoking cigarettes. Uh, he mentions one about Islam having uh, rules about any kind, of, any kind of like sexual activity anywhere in public. Uh, and he, he, he has lists of these and he thinks those kind of rules, when you add them all together, go against uh, freedoms that we think people should have. Uh, another way it goes against Amer uh, a deeply ingrained American value that he thinks is, excuse me, uh, he says that Islam is very anti-gay. He says that in Islam, in many Islamic countries, they beat gays or they stone gays or they kill gays. And he thinks that Islam is very anti-gay. And that to him is uh, something that really goes against American, the American values of, uh, you know, freedom of expression, freedom for people to be what they want, uh, freedom to, from, from non-discrimination against certain minorities. So that's a second way he thinks Islam conflicts with American values. Actually, a third way. We have Islam restricts, uh, re restricts the liberty of women, Islam restricts everybody's personal freedoms, and Islam is anti-gay and discriminates against gays. Uh, he also points out, uh, he says, another way that Islam goes against American values is that it's intolerant in that uh, he says in the Quran it tells Islam to kill there are a number of places where it says that, that people who are Muslims should uh, not tolerate non-believers and kill non-believers. And I should I just want to periodically say this as I go through this uh, broadcast. We are not here endorsing Milo's views or giving any opinion on his views. All I'm trying to do here today is to give you a summary of his views as he's presented them in his various speeches and lectures. So again, one of the way, another way he thinks that Islam goes against American values is that it wants to kill non-believers and not be tolerant of them. And that would, of course, go against the American, you know, freedom of speech uh, and don't infringe on others' rights as long as not, they're not infringing on your rights, that kind of stuff. So he, he would, um, and, and now, he thinks we need to be, so, so Islam, he thinks, conflicts with American values in all of these ways. And he thinks we need to be concerned about Islam because he feels that it's a big part of Islam to want Sharia law. He thinks that people who are true Muslims want to have Sharia law. And Sharia law, so it would be one thing, he thinks that if, 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 if there are more Muslims and, they, and Islam becomes more influential, there will be those kind of, in any society, those kind of uh, like restrictions on freedom I just talked about will become part of that society. And so he doesn't want to ha he doesn't think we should want that to happen in American society because as I said, Islam uh, has certain aspects of it which go against fundamental American values. And uh, he thinks, uh, you know, a goal of, as I said, a goal of Islam is to institute Sharia law. Now, one obvious objection that someone could make to these views would be, well, look, Milo, I don't think, you know, I, I could see radical Muslims adopting all of the views you say that conflict with American values. And I could see radical Muslims wanting Sharia law. But this doesn't describe how most Muslims are. Uh, this doesn't describe moderate Muslims. And Milo, you're only talking about uh, radical Muslims. So he actually gives a response to this, though. So this is an important part of his argument, because if he was just talking about radical Muslims and he thought radical Muslims was a small part of the Muslim population, uh, there wouldn't be much of a reason to worry about uh, Islam, and there wouldn't be no, much reason in this country to worry about Islam. So a key part of his argument is not just that Islam, as, as written, strictly speaking, goes against American values. It's that he thinks mainstream Islam goes against American values. And his response to this, argu this objection that people might make, which is like, hey, Milo, um, you know, not that many Muslims actually think these things you're saying about Islam. They, they don't actually buy into that stuff. And uh, these are just the radical Muslims and the moderate Muslims, who are most of the Muslims, don't buy into this stuff. 
His response to that is, there aren't as many moderate Muslims as people claim they are, and moderate Muslims are not that big a part of Islam, of the total Muslim population. And he gives a couple arguments for this. And one point I want to make again, uh, uh, repeatedly today is that uh, whether you agree or disagree with Milo's statements, he does give arguments for his views. He doesn't just stay, state his views and not give arguments for them. So if you really want to you know, understand his position, I would suggest going to his speeches and actually looking, reading them, and you can see his exact arguments he gives. Uh, but you, you don't, you don't want to, with, with Milo or really with any thinker, on the left, on the right, in between, wherever, you don't just want to, I think if you, if you, if you want to really critique their view and know, where, and know where you stand on it and really give it a fair hearing, you don't just want to take the bullet points. You want to understand the arguments for their main claims. So right now we're exploring uh, Milo's response. So we had Milo, just to sum up, well, where, what have we done so far? Well, we're talking about how Milo uh, has three main targets, Islam, radical feminism, Black Lives Matter. We've, we've focused on Islam, and we talked about his main critique of Islam is that we need to worry about it because Islam goes fundamentally against many American values, and Islam wants to institute Sharia law, so if, which, 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 if that happened, would go against many American values. Uh, and we talked about there's an objection to that view, which would say, well, hey, Milo, you know, most Muslims don't believe the things you say that Islam believes. Most Muslims are moderate Muslims and not radical Muslims, and moderate Muslims don't believe all these things that you're attributing to Islam. And his response to that is that there actually are not that many moderate Muslims. Now, what is his argument for this claim? So he gives a couple points, and excuse me, periodically I will need to take a drink of water here. So, one thing he says, he, he, he gives up anecdotal evidence, like a personal evidence that, uh, from his experience, but he also gives like statistical evidence. So, as anecdotal evidence, he just says, and you might, and you know, this again, this is anecdotal evidence from his personal experience, the moderate Muslims he's come into contact with, people who say they're moderate mu Muslims, he says they're not really practicing Muslims. Uh, they don't go to service as much and they're just not that involved in the religion. And the people he knows that are like that, which he says are pretty much all of the moderate Muslims he knows, the people who claim to be moderate Muslims, he considers those people not moderate Muslims, but really not very Muslim. So he would say, if you're somebody who was born Muslim, maybe raised Muslim, but now you don't go to uh, many services and you don't really, you're not really that involved in the religion part, in, your, in like the organized religion part, and maybe you don't like read up on it that much, he would say, we shouldn't consider that person a Muslim. That's his view on that. Uh, so that's his anecdotal evidence, his personal evidence that there aren't many moderate Muslims. But he also cites, cites statistics. So uh, one of the statistics he cites is a poll that says 51% of Muslim Americans want to be governed by Sharia law. 51% of Muslim Americans. And he says, if 51% of America, Muslim Americans want to be governed by Sharia law, that shows that most, it's not true for, that um, in America most Muslims are moderate Muslims. Because he thinks if most moderate Muslims in America were moderate Muslims, that number would be much lower. He also says that, he cites a statistic that's from a poll that says 33% of Muslim Americans take precedence, say that if the Sharia law conflicts with the U.S. Constitution, Sharia law should take precedence over the U.S. Constitution. And he interprets that as showing, again, he thinks that supports the view that uh, moderate Muslims are not that many of American Muslims, and he thinks of Muslims in general. Um, oh, and finally, an another statistic he, support, he cites to support this is he says, uh, he cites a poll which says 58% of Muslim Americans think criticism of Islam or Mohammed is not protected free speech under the First Amendment. And he thinks that if, if, mo if, if there were moderate Muslims, they would think that uh, criticism of Islam or Muhammad was protected free speech under the First Amendment. So he thinks that this statistical evidence supports his view and his anecdotal personal evidence. He thinks that supports his view that there really aren't that many moderate Muslims. So he thinks most of the Muslims out there that are really, he would call Muslims, uh, believe the views that we talked about earlier that are antithetical to American values. 
And that's why he thinks we need to be worried about Islam. Uh, and I should, before closing this segment here on uh, what Milo thinks about Islam and his complaints about it and his reasons he thinks we should be worried about it, I just want to point out a couple extra things he says. Uh, he also says that um, Muslims uh, want to be treated well as a minority in the West. You know, we try in the West to give minorities certain protections and make sure they're not discriminated against. And so he says they ask for that. But he points, he thinks that that's a contrast because in, their, in countries that are mostly Muslim, he says they treat minorities not well in those countries. So he talks, in one of his lectures, he talks a lot about Indonesia, which is a predominantly Muslim country, and he talks about how religious minorities in, those con- in that country are not treated well and they're discriminated against. So he thinks he has a problem with Muslims wanting to get you know, protections in Western countries, but in countries where they're a minority, but he thinks that conflicts with how they treat minorities, religious minorities in predominantly Muslim countries. And one additional point he makes uh, about Muslims, and one complaint he has, is, not, well, this is not a complaint, it's more of a, this is another point that supports his claim that we should worry about Islam. He thinks that uh, Muslims are actually not integrating well into Western countries where they are. And a, a point of this argument is, so when he says this, you might say, well, maybe that's, that's true for, you know, for older Muslims who weren't in this country that much, but the younger Muslims are you know, integrating better. But he claims, he claims that younger Muslims are actually more radical and more separatist than older Muslims are when we talk about Muslims who are living in Western countries. He thinks the Muslims in Western countries are more radical, uh, the younger Muslims in Western countries are more radical and more separatist than the older Muslims in Western countries, and he thinks that shows that uh, they're not integrating well. So to sum up his worry about Islam, again, he thinks Islam is fundamentally in conflict with American values, with certain American values, like certain freedoms and non-discrimination. He thinks that most Muslims, uh, he thinks, so there's an objection to this that says, well, and he, all right, so, and he thinks that, he thinks we should be worried about that because he thinks, he says that Muslim is the fastest growing religion. So he thinks Americans should be worried about Islam growing and getting more influence because it's in conflict with fundamental American values. And there's an, uh, an objection which is often given to this, which is that, well, that's radical Muslims, but that's not moderate Muslims, and most, moderns especially, most Muslims, especially in America, are moderate Muslims. But his response to that is actually moderate Muslims are way fewer of Muslims than uh, people have said they are, and there actually not, aren't that many moderate Muslims, and so we should be worried. So that's the basic grain of his argument about Muslims, about why should we, we should be worried about Muslims. So uh, let's take a second here to breathe for a second and recap what we're doing here. We're summarizing the views for all of you out there who want to know more about Milo Yiannopoulos. I'm Steve Luckner. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter or ask me any questions about this, uh, I won't be taking questions during the broadcast just to not slow things up. But uh, feel free at any time. You can direct message me on Twitter, at Luckner, at L-O-O-K-N-E-R. Happy to have a dialogue about any of this. Um, and really, to repeat what we're doing here, all we're doing here is Milo Yiannopoulos has been in the news a lot. He's become very prominent as a conservative uh, thinker. And we want people to be better informed about what he thinks. And we think just the discussion about him is it's, it's much better served for everyone if he's going to be in the discussion. Uh, and people are going to be talking about him and, and deciding about, hey, should we have him at our campus or somebody else is having him at our, at our campus, should we protest? And we think it's better for people to know his actual views. So what I'm doing today is trying my best to, in a brief, easy to understand format, summarize Milo Yiannopoulos' views as I understand them to be. So that's what we're trying to do. And in the fir- we, what, what I've said to start out was that he has three main targets in his views. One is Islam, two is radical feminism, three is Black Lives Matter. If you look at, go back and look at his stuff on the web and the speeches and the, and the videos, that's really the focus of, of all of it. Uh, and I mean, there's things here and there that don't talk about that, but that's really the focus. And we just, in part one of this video, talked about his views on Islam. So in part two of this video, which we're going to begin now after I take another drink of water, we are going to talk about his views on radical feminism and what his problem is with radical feminism. And now I will take a sip. And uh, 
you know, I know this video it might end up being being a little long. Well, I don't know how you define long, but it's not going to be short, short. But I, I thought it was better, you know, hey, it's YouTube, so you can stop this, play it, play it later, you know, listen to it in chunks. But I thought it was better. What I tried to do is how can I make this as succinct as possible while still giving you the best, like, general summary of a view? So I'm really trying for that. So if I didn't do that, let me know. T- uh, direct message me on Twitter at Lookner and say, hey, it was too long or too short. But that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so we're now into part two. Part two of Milo Yiannopoulos' views. Part two is his views against radical feminism. <clears throat> now, I should point out here, right at the beginning, it's important when you're understanding what his view is on radical feminism to get clear on what his target is. So his target is not feminism in general. And his target is not feminism that calls for equality between men and women. He does not think that's what radical feminism is. Radical feminism, which he also calls third wave feminism, to him is this feminism that's become recently uh, uh, popular, recently um, important in uh, feminist circles. And uh, these are the feminists you see on TV a lot recently. This is his target. It's not feminism in general. And he even says, he'll, he'll say, like, feminism now is not about, this is what he believes. This, he believes that radical feminism, which is the main, the main feminist people you see out there nowadays, he thinks these feminists are not actually going for equality between men and women. He thinks they're going through some, for something else. And we'll talk about that in a second. But that is an important point. So he's not, a, when we say Milo, one of his big views is he's against radical feminism. He is not against feminism. And in fact, he is not against any feminist who is fighting for making women and men have equal rights and equal opportunities and those kind of things. So let that be clear that is not his target. And he, it's implied in his writings that he is okay with that. So he is against a specific type of more recent feminist that he feels is fighting for something uh, more or different than just equality between the sexes. And uh, he also points out he has gotten emails from women who thank him for, uh, you know, they, they're, he says a lot of women write him and are opposed to this specific brand of feminism. So he's, his target is a specific brand of feminism. So what is his problem with this thing, radical feminism, third wave feminism, which again is, uh, as in, in brief, is the branch of feminism which has become prominent in recent years, according to Milo? What is his problem with this? So his basic problem with radical feminism, if you can sum it up, is that he thinks radical feminism is harmful to both men and women. Radical feminism, in Milo's view, is harmful to both men and women. He doesn't think it helps either group. He thinks it hurts both groups. And he gives a number of arguments to back up this claim. So what are those arguments? What are those arguments um, against uh, that he gives that radical feminism hurts both men and women? So let's begin by talking about his view on uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment laws. So Milo says that in recent years, due to feminist pressure, there have been changes in sexual assault and sexual harassment laws. Uh, And these changes have resulted in laws that he he uses the word Kafkaesque to describe them. He thinks these laws are kind of crazy, uh, and he definitely thinks these laws uh, have problems with them. So let's get into specifics here. What does he think these uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault laws, what, 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 what is his problem with them? Well, one target of his attack here is uh, affirmative consent laws. So affirmative consent laws have, in recent years, been uh, about uh, sexual uh, harassment, and uh, I believe they apply to uh, rape, too, and sexual encounters between men and women. Uh, Affirmative consent laws, the basic idea, as Milo presents it, of affirmative consent laws, is that there needs to be explicit consent by... uh, I'll say the female now, but I'm guessing it would apply to like, uh, you know, homosexual uh, between 
between man and man, and also I'm guessing it would apply if uh, to men as well. So I'm going to put this in terms of men and females, and it apply and, and, and putting it in terms of uh, heterosexual male female relationships, and as applying to what the ma- the female has to give consent. But it, it probably it, I'm guessing it applies to all genders and all combinations and stuff. But this is how I'm putting it. So. Affirmative ca- consent laws, according to Milo, basically say something like this. Uh, if there's a sexual encounter between a male and a female, the female needs to give explicit consent uh, at every step of the interaction. So, for example, we could imagine an interaction between a male and a female where they initially start by like holding hands and then they go to kissing and then they get to more and more and some clothes come off and we have more stuff and finally at the end, you know, they do the complete act. Uh, and Milo would say that affir- according to affirmative consent laws, at every step in that process, there needs to be explicit consent. Like the person has to say like, yes, I'm cool with this, the woman, for there to be affirmative consent. And Affirmative consent laws say that if there's not affirmative consent, then we have a violation of the law. There is some sexual misconduct going on. Uh, and Milo uh, says that, um, and, and, and just so, and a fact about this is that a number of schools and states in recent years have adopted affirmative consent laws to govern sexual interactions. And a, a point, another point I should emphasize here is that Milo thinks uh, he's, he focuses on, when he talks about radical feminism, he very often focuses on colleges. Uh, and the reason he does that is he thinks radical feminism is especially powerful and especially influential, influential in colleges, in academia. So he thinks like male college students, for example, are especially affected by, well, he would say male, female college students too, but people in college are especially affected, he thinks in a negative way, by radical feminism. So he does, I just want to say that as an aside, he focuses on colleges a lot. So anyway. Milo says there are these uh, affirmative consent laws that he thinks have come into place in recent years uh, due to radical feminist influence. And he thinks these laws are bad for both men and women. Now, why does he think this? Well, in terms of why they're bad for men, Milo thinks that affirmative consent laws are really bad for men because they make it incredibly easy for a man to be accused and charged with some kind of sexual misconduct. And the reason he says this is that um, in a typical sexual encounter between a man and a woman, there is not affirmative consent. uh, There is not explicit consent given at every single stage. Actually, I think he would say that like rarely if ever happens. Uh, that you don't have someone, a, a guy asking, okay, can I hold your hand now? Can I kiss you now on the, on the lips? Can I kiss you now doing something more than the lips? And going every single step and asking. And uh, there are also arguments to be given on this where uh, it's said that, you know, not only is it a rare, and the people are not in the practice of doing this kind of thing, so it's very easy not to do it because no one's in the practice of doing this, but also um, that if males do this, it's like seen as a mood killer. So um, for many people, Milo would say, uh, if the guy is asking every step of the way, uh, hey, is it okay if we do this? Hey, is it okay if we do that? And the girl has to say yes, uh, that is a mood killer and it might actually prevent the sexual interaction from happening. And his view is that this is just the way most couples, heterosexual couples interact. So to require them So to require them to do this thing which they never do and no one's used to doing and also which is a mood killer puts this great burden on men and it's so easy for that to not be followed by guys that it makes it incredibly easy uh, for guys to get in trouble and to get accused and charged with sexual, with a violation of affirmative consent laws. And in addition, there's all these things about like, what are the, you know, if you say, if you say explicit consent at every single stage, well, if there's a sexual encounter, think of all the different stages you could define. And uh, it, there's certainly ways of breaking down a single sexual encounter where you could define a lot of different stages, uh, like a removal of a certain piece of clothing, for example. And uh, if every one of those counts as a stage, then a woman could, in theory, at the end, pick out just a single stage, say, you know, when, uh, when the guy took off my jeans and say, I didn't give affirmative consent to that. And if you read the affirmative consent law a certain way and we interpret taking off jeans as a stage, even if the guy asked about 
if everything was okay at every other step and he didn't ask about that one step, uh, technically under the law, the guy could be accused. So the overall point here, according to Milo, is that because of radical feminism, uh, these affirmative consent laws about sexual encounters have been passed, uh, and they make it incredibly easy uh, to, for guys to get accused in charge of sexual misconduct, and also they put a very unreasonable burden on the guys in sexual encounters. Uh, and another thing Milo says about these laws, he says, remember I said before, Milo is not against feminists who he thinks want to make the sexes equal, who want equality. But he thinks these affirmative consent laws are designed, he says, to give con complete control in the sexual encounter to women. So he points out that he says in, in American society now, give, uh, basically in uh, these in sexual relationships, in the relationships between men and women, women have this control in the sense of men have to ask them for dates. Men have to make the first move. So men are the one who like are putting their, you know, uh, they're putting themselves on the line, putting their respect on the line and risk being embarrassed and ashamed and being rejected. So men already have this burden in relationships of doing this. Uh, but he thinks on top of that, the, so, so he thinks if anything, like relationships before affirmative consent laws were not, they were not unequally burdened, they were not uh, tilted towards women. He thinks if anything, men had more of a burden before, or at least an equal burden because they had to do all the asking and all the making the first move and risk rejection. But he says with these affirmative consent laws, he says radical feminists are going for like con complete control of the whole sexual encounter. So. That's a problem he has with, um, rat with, that's a way he thinks that affirmative consent laws, which he says are a result of radical feminism, uh, he says they put uh, an unreasonable burden on men and they harm men because, uh, you know, they make men have to do this thing they're not used to doing and it's a mood killer and it's easy to get, for, and it makes it easy for them to get accused. And the big point is it makes it very easy for them to get accused of sexual misconduct in, uh, in, in situations when he would say the men hasn't done, man hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, and furthermore, he points out that, he, and, this is, and this is an additional way he thinks that radical feminism, by, by encouraging these laws to get passed, these affirmative consent laws to get passed, hurts men. He says, if a man on a college campus is accused of sexual misconduct under an affirmative consent law, he says the system to adjudicate that is uh, biased against, uh, tilted against men. He says that what will happen is this won't be adjudicated in court. It'll be adjudicated in some kind of uh, university council kind of thing co comprised of people from the university. Uh, and he thinks academia this, these days is, he thinks, uh, largely influenced by radical feminism. So odds are that body will be, uh, have people who are sympathetic to radical feminism. And he won't get, according to Milo, legal representation uh, in this, in this uh, meeting with this, uh, in this whole procedure with this uh, college council. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, keep, I, I, I apologize. I've, I, I know it's Milo and once in a while I say Milo. So thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Micah just gave me a reminder, so thank you. And I apologize in the future. I know I'll do it, so uh, I apologize. So, so he thinks that not only is it easy for, with these affirmative uh, consent laws for uh, men who haven't done anything wrong to get accused of sexual misconduct, he thinks that once it goes to this, if they're in a college and they do this and they get accused, the, the, the adjudication process is tilted against them. So he thinks in, in these ways, these affirmative consent laws are bad for men. And he argues that this is, well, so that's his argument that Affirmative consent laws, which have been uh, our result in his view of radical feminists and their influence, are bad for men. That's one argument. But he also says these affirmative consent laws are bad for women. And you might wonder why that is. So here is uh, his argument why affirmative consent laws are bad for women. What Milo says is happening recently, in recent years, is that as these laws have changed, to make it more dangerous and risky for guys to enter into sexual relations with women because he says there's an increased likelihood of them getting uh, accused of sexual misconduct in cases where they haven't done anything wrong. Um, 
He says that men have started to draw back from wanting to have uh, relationships with women. He uses this phrase, the sexodus. Uh, he says there's been a sexodus, uh, an exodus of men from relationships with women involving uh, sex, like you know, dating relationships, that kind of thing, or any kind of sexual relationships. And he says there's been a much bigger focus from young men on things like uh, video games and porn. And he says that men in general don't are more wary of being in relationships uh, because of all of this affirmative consent law stuff. And he says that's hurt women because it's reduced the pool of available men for women to date. And he thinks women now have much less choice in who to date because a lot of men who they normally would date and would be putting themselves out there are much less wanting to get in a relationship because of the difficulties presented by affirmative consent laws. So he would argue that the affirmative consent laws that are a result of radical feminist influence uh, hurt both men and women. So that's one way. That's one way he says that radical feminism hurts both men and women. Uh, let's talk about a second way now, a related way. Uh, a second way is he thinks there's a similar point to be made about marriage. Uh, I'm sorry, I need a drink. So Milo, and not Milo, thinks uh, that he takes a view um, that has been adopted by, there's a bigger movement called the men's rights movement, and if you want to know anything more about this view, uh, you should go look up men's rights movement. But he says that um, the divorce laws and the child custody laws that come into play in divorce are unfair to men. Uh, now, I know he thinks this, but he is not, like the writings I've seen of his, he doesn't go into detail about this, and I'm guessing uh, he has I know he has thoughts about, I'm guessing he has thoughts about this, but I'm also guessing that like, well, let me just say this. If you want more on that, I wouldn't go to his writings. I would look up like men's rights movements for more of the background on that kind of view. But there is this view out there that uh, divorce laws and uh, child custody laws are uh, tilted towards women and are, 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 are tilted against men. He believes this. And he says that, and he thinks that, there's an implication that that is also a result of the influence of radical feminism. Not feminism that wants the sexes to be equal, but radical feminism that wants something different than that, that wants, say, control over men. Uh, it seems that something he thinks is that radical feminisms, what they really want is something more than equality. They want, like, control over men, or they have antipathy towards men, and he thinks uh, one of the reflections of that is in divorce law and child custody law, which he thinks is tilted against men. <coughs> and because of this tilt, um, he says that a lot of men out there are actually uh, don't want to get married anymore because they look at these laws, and that's one reason he thinks they don't want to get married, is that they look at these laws that are now against, make, make things really difficult and are tilted against, he thinks, men, these divorce laws and child custody laws, uh, and it, it, it makes the whole prospect of marriage more negative to them because what if there's a divorce, then all this stuff has to be dealt with. And he says that hurts women because not only do we have men not wanting to be in relationships because of the factor just mentioned, we also have men not wanting to get married. And if men don't want to get married, women who want to get married have a, a harder time finding a man to get, man to get married to and there's fewer available men out there. Uh, another reason and another thing he says uh, about why men doesn't want to get married and, and, and why radical feminism contributes to this, he says that because radical feminists are sort of like prominent in the media, uh, and that's a, they, you, they get a lot of attention in the media, and, and, the, and, and, and radical feminists in the media seem hostile to men in a lot of ways, he thinks that affects many men's view of women in general. And he thinks it makes men worry, oh, if I marry someone, they might end up being like uh, these radical feminists I see on TV and the, it could result in difficulties for me as a man. So he thinks the picture uh, presented by radical feminism as being like anti-man affects men's view of women in general and that is another reason why uh, radical feminism makes fewer guys want to get married which he thinks hurts women. Uh, okay, uh, and, uh, and so we've talked about a couple ways in which uh, Milo Yiannopoulos thinks radical feminism is harmful to both men and women. Let's talk about a couple more. Another reason Milo thinks uh, radical feminism is harmful, and, and this is directed towards men, is he claims that uh, women's 
cancers get more focus in the media than men's cancers do. And he specifically talks about breast cancer and prostate cancer. And something he says is that uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer affect this. So breast cancer affects the same number of women roughly as prostate cancer affects the number of men. But the amount of money and media attention going to breast cancer is much more than the amount of money and media attention going to prostate cancer. And, and he also cites a statistic that he says, uh, a statistic that says there are almost nearly three times more articles on NPR about women's cancers than men's cancers. And he thinks this is a result of uh, the influence of radical feminism in the media. Uh, he thinks that that has resulted, because there are women's cancers, uh, there's more of an attention on them, and he thinks radical feminism hurts men because more media attention and money is spent, ends up being spent on women's cancers than men's cancers. And as I do want to periodically repeat on this show, what we're doing here is for everyone's uh, edification, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, every, just to let it, we, we're trying to give everybody out there who wants to know a little more about Milo just a picture of what his views are. We're not endorsing them, we're not not endorsing them. Well, I am just trying to give you a summary in the best brief, easy to understand way I can of his views so that you can be more informed when uh, he comes up in discussion or when you're thinking about any issues involving Milo. Uh, so we've talked about a few ways he thinks that radical feminism is harmful to both men and women. And uh, there's a couple more here I want to talk about real briefly before we move on to our next and final part of our, uh, our broadcast here. Uh, so these are a couple, in addition to the different ways, uh, the, the ways I've mentioned, he makes a few additional points about radical feminism. Uh, he says uh, radical feminism calls for these safe spaces on college campuses. But he think, thinks um, these safe spaces uh, aren't good for women. He thinks, that, so safe spaces are these places on colleges where like, you know, it's restricted what you can talk about and, and the kind of views you can have and it's supposed to be bases, spaces where you can't like advance certain kind of opinions where people could go. And he thinks that by trying to emphasize these safe spaces um, on college campuses, radical feminism makes people, and specifically women, it results in them uh, having uh, greater ignorance, greater fragility. Uh, he calls it a toddler mentality. And his point here is that he thinks by keeping uh, women and people in general in college safe or not being able to ha have opposing views presented to them, uh, he thinks that makes these people less prepared for the real world. That's his point here. He thinks in the real world you can't avoid hearing various views and you're going to come across people with various views and you need to be prepared to deal with them. And he thinks colleges, uh, and to think about them, and to think critically about them, and he thinks colleges, radical feminists by encouraging these safe spaces actually get in the way of preparing students for the real world. Uh, he also argues that gender studies courses, which radical feminists really promote, he says they are not helpful in preparing uh, students for the real world. Uh, now, uh, there are a few additional issues about radical feminism he has, which I'll go over briefly here. He has a problem with radical feminists uh, pushing for restrictions on hate speech, and, f and, uh, and it's, uh, it's hate speech, and there's another term for this, and I, I wrote down hate speech and hate speech, so that obviously isn't it. But Milo thinks that um, a number of the regulations about hate speech that are being pushed for, uh, especially in college campuses, are pushed for by radical feminists. Um, and he thinks he has two main problems with these radical feminist uh, pushed uh, re restrictions on hate speech. One problem he has with these restrictions is he says hate speech is not a well-defined term. Uh, even on the Tucker Carlson interview, which I saw last night, uh, he said uh, he doesn't know what hate speech means. He thinks hate speech is a term basically people use to mean uh, dialogue that uh, makes me feel uncomfortable. Dialogue I don't like. Uh, and he thinks what restrictions on hate speech do is basically it's just a way by calling it hate speech to restrict stuff people say which makes other people feel uncomfortable. And these are restrictions that he doesn't think are American because he thinks we, ha we, should be, we are free as Americans to say anything we want. Uh, making, making something uncomfortable is not a reason to ban speech. We are, that kind of speech is protected as long as you're not uh, doing more harm to somebody uh, under the First Amendment, uh, First Amendment under freedom of speech. So he would argue 
argue that these uh, regulations for hate speech, he says hate speech uh, regulations that are pushed by rad radical feminists, he doesn't know what hate speech means, uh, it's not well defined, uh, and also uh, it just, it, he thinks it's a term for like just speech that makes people, feel, makes people feel uncomfortable. And what you end up having is these hate speech regulations are actually regulations against speech that makes people feel uncomfortable, which he thinks uh, goes against uh, a fundamental American belief in freedom of speech. Uh, he also says, uh, and this is a key point of this argument about hate speech regulation, and this is a point he repeats frequently uh, in his interviews that I've seen. He feels that radical feminists and the left in general, they fail to distinguish between speech and action. They fail to distinguish between speech and action. What does he mean by this? Milo thinks that if you're somebody and you're like physically harming somebody else, so say if there's a conservative out there who's running around physically harming liberals or phys physically harming certain uh, minority groups. Well, of course he thinks that person should be uh, you know, arrested or prosecuted. That person should not be allowed on a college campus. If they're doing physical harm or you, know, you could say monetary harm or you know, actual uh, material harm to people uh, and they're taking action against someone to do them harm, he doesn't think that should be allowed no matter on what side somebody's on. But if they're on the conservative side, he does not think that should be allowed. But he thinks when liberals, people on the left, including radical feminists, he thinks a lot of their outrage, and especially when like a conservative like Milo comes at a talks to a college campus and there's riots and they don't let him speak, he thinks they're confusing uh, actions with words. All he's doing, he would say, is he's saying things. Now he might be saying things that make people feel uncomfortable, but that's protected. That's freedom of speech. And there's no reason you should be preventing him, he would say, from coming to a college or going anywhere and saying that stuff because he hasn't violated anything in the Constitution. He hasn't, vi he hasn't uh, violated anyone's rights. Uh, he hasn't, uh, he, he's not doing anything which, which we think as Americans, according to our Constitution, somebody should not be allowed to do. But, so he thinks, but the reaction he gets at, conser at college campuses and other places where he goes, speaks, goes and speaks. And the reaction a lot of conservatives get, gets is the reaction of this outrage and this protest and wanting to shut them down that would be appropriate only if they were acting against people. He says all he's doing is saying words. He's using words, he's not using actions. And while his words may fee might make other people feel uncomfortable, he's not taking action against those people. He's not physically harming them. He's not taking money out of their bank account. And he thinks the reaction, the left and radical feminists in particular, confuse these two things and they don't distinguish. And they react to him as if he's taking action and not as if he's just saying words. So that's a problem he has with, another problem he has with radical feminism. Uh, an additional problem he has with radical feminism is he says uh, it tells women what to do and it has a very specific view of what women should do. And if women aren't on board with that, then they're not good feminists. So for example, he, according to him, radical feminism tells uh, stay-at-home moms that that they're not, that that's wrong, that's not what women should be doing. He thinks radical feminism pushes for like women to always be working and, uh, and making money in the workplace and he thinks radical feminism is opposed to women who uh, just want to just want to stay at home and like be a mom and he's in Milo says that a lot of women actually do want to do this and uh, Radical feminists feminists don't approve of them and he doesn't approve of that of that part of radical feminism um, And he thinks that radical feminists try to tell women exactly what to do and they shouldn't be doing this uh, finally uh, a, a, a One other point about radical feminism and I've left it to the end, but it is a big point in his view is he thinks that there's this key premise of radical feminism, or the key premises, that are just not true. Uh, radical feminists, he says, say that in today's America, today's America, there is uh, both a wage gap and a patriarchy uh, that are due to this sexist structure of society. And he thinks neither of those are the case. Now, let's take them one at a time. Uh, he, radical feminists, he says, says there's this wage gap that men get paid more than women and this is due to sexism in society. Now, Milo doesn't deny that there's a difference in wages. So it's important to see that when he says there's no wage gap, his argument is that, he, what he's not saying is that there's no difference in wages. What he's saying is that there's no sexist wage gap. 
He believes that the wage gap between men and women is because women voluntarily choose fields that pay less. He uh, points out uh, in, in various places that he says that uh, men voluntarily choose, for example, voluntarily choose way more than women to go into STEM fields, to science and technology and engineering and mathematics. Way more when men than women, he says, voluntarily choose to go into those fields than women do. Way, vo- way more men choose to go in those fields than women do. And women, he says, more than men, the fields they choose to go in more are fields that pay less, like elementary education, he says. Um, what else? He's social work. Uh, so he says that this wage gap It's there, but it's the result of voluntary choices and not the result of this established institutional sexism. And he, so he thinks there's no sexist wage gap there, even, and, and that goes against what the, uh, a big claim the radical feminists make. And, th- and the second point he says is that, uh, uh, second, the second thing we talked about in terms of <clears throat> a basic thing that radical feminists think that's there, that needs to be fought against, which Milo thinks is not there. Oh, let me go back for a second to the wage gap thing. So uh, another point he makes is that, uh, you know, you might object to Milo's claim that uh, one objection that's given sometimes to the cl- Milo's claim there's no, that, that, that uh, so Milo says that more women uh, voluntar- more, more men voluntarily go into STEM fields and, more wi- and women don't as much want to study those fields. Like th- these are the science and technology and engineering mathematics fields. And somebody might say, well, hey Milo, the reason women don't go into those fields is those fields present a non-welcoming sexist environment for women. That's why they're not enrolling in those, in those kind of pl- uh, subjects, not because they don't want to. Uh, Milo disagrees with that. He denies that those fields are sexist. And actually, so one of the arguments he gives against that is he says, if you look at those fields, there are studies that show that like in these science, technology, these STEM jobs, uh, women, it's much easier for them to get promoted, he says, than men. Men get passed over much more, much, much more, uh, much more than women do uh, because uh, companies want to be known as diverse. They want to be known as diverse. And so because they want to be known as diverse, they uh, go out of their way to promote the few women who are there. They go out of their way to promote them. So that's one of the reasons that Milo denies that there is this, uh, if you were a woman and you work in a STEM field, like it's stacked against you and it's sexist and stuff. So. The other, uh, the last point about uh, feminism I want to make here is just the one about the patriarchy. And he says a big claim of radical feminists is that there's this patriarchy, there's this society is male dominated, uh, males are in power everywhere, it's stacked against females, and he basically denies this. He says that's not the case, and they're wrong to say that. Uh, So, uh, and so he denies these basic pillars of radical feminism that there's this patriarchy and that there's this wage gap that need to be fought against. Okay. So, that's the end of the mini segment, well, the, of, the, of, of, the, of the segment we're doing on why my Loganopolis is against radical feminism. So what have we done so far? We're trying to give you a summary of Milo Yiannopoulos' views. I hope it's been helpful to you. I'm trying to just give you a clear summary of what he thinks, what his basic views he presents in his speeches and his writings is, and so when you see him and hear him talked about, uh, you can know what he basically believes. And, uh, the first, we've talked about how he has three main targets in his speeches, in his writings. Uh, we have Islam is one, radical feminism is two, Black Lives Matter is three. Uh, and uh, we've covered his views on Islam and radical feminism. I'm going to briefly cover his views on Black Lives Matter. That'll be a shorter segment because uh, his, his, he doesn't have as much writings out there about black, speeches about Black Lives Matter that I've seen. And I think you can kind of summarize that in a couple basic points. and then. The last thing I want to do today is look at one, of, one, one specific article he wrote and talk about the difference between the headline and the article, which I think is important when trying to uh, understand Milo. So our, this will be the third section. This is going to be much shorter than the first two. And this is on what Milo, why he argues against Black Lives Matter, which is one of his three main targets. Uh, as I see it, there's really two main points he has against Black Lives Matter that he argues against. His first main point, uh, his first main objection to the Black Lives Matter movement is that he thinks that movement does not focus on the things that they would focus on if they were really best, mo- really, really concerned with improving black lives. He thinks that 
The problem they focus on, this problem of white on black violence, specifically uh, involving police, white policemen, he thinks this is a very minor problem in terms of the problems facing uh, blacks in America. And he thinks if they really thought black lives matter and they really want to help black lives, uh, they would be focusing on other issues. And he talks about specifically a couple of these other issues. And he gives uh, uh, statistics which he thinks supports these claims. His basic claims here are one claim he makes is he gives statistics that says uh, most of the violence against blacks in this country is committed by blacks uh, and not by whites. And also, that's one thing, and he also says, he cites statistics which he says show that uh, white cop killings of black men are much less than you might actually think given the media portrayal. And the message here he's trying to, he's giving is he thinks this supports the claim that if Black Lives Matter really cared about black lives, what they'd be focusing on is on reducing black on black uh, murders rather than w reducing white police on black murders, which are actually a very small, very small percentage, he says, of uh, black murders in America. Another point he makes is that he says that Black Lives Matter, if they really want to help black lives, they should be focusing on obesity. He says, according to his statistics, that uh, the uh, black population is the most obese by percentage population in this country, demographic-wise, and he says that they could really be helped uh, by Black Lives Matter if black lives could focus on reducing obesity. That would make black people much healthier, he says, and focusing their energy there would improve black lives much more than, improve, than focusing on this small percentages of black murders which are caused by white cops. So that's basic point one of his two basic points against Black Lives Matter, which is that he says uh, Black Lives Matter doesn't focus on the things they should be focusing on if they really want to help black lives. The second chief point he makes against Black Lives Matter is, according to him, he thinks Black Lives Matter has an element of racism to it because he says that Black Lives Matter has called in the past for uh, harming white policemen. And also, he says that in protests, uh, there have been play times when Black Lives Matter protesters have specifically targeted whites. And a claim he makes is he says that like Black Lives Matter is the only organization which has racism involved in it, which he thinks is ex still acceptable in mainstream like uh, American society to be to to support. So he says something like you know uh, you can be like in a nice Manhattan dinner and you can support Black Lives Matter uh, and no one calls you out on it. But if you gained any other uh, organization involving that has some aspect of racism to it, uh, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't. Be, you would be called out on. And so, and the way he puts it, I think he says the words, uh, Black Lives Matter is the, is the only racist organization in America now that is acceptable, uh, I think he says, in, in like mainstream America. So these are his views. Those are his two main complaints about the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, again, as a, so, so there's one more segment left in this, and I want to once again say, I feel like I should repeat saying this. We are not endorsing any of Milo's views by saying them here. Uh, we're not not endorsing them. We're taking uh, the, the purpose of this is not to endorse or to analyze in the sense or, or give critical analysis or to we're giving critical analysis in terms of explaining the views, but we're not supposed to like judge that we're not judging the views here. We're leaving that to you. All we're doing here is giving you the viewer a better idea, hopefully, of what he thinks. And I would encourage all of you, if you want to know more, go online, look at his speeches, look at his articles. That's where you're going to find more detailed arguments like the ones I've been giving you here. So uh, we have one more segment left here. And in this last segment, what I wanted to do is just uh, point out something that, uh, that uh, Milo says. Um, that I, I want to point out a specific example of a headline Milo gives uh, that for an article that is different that you might that actually seems different than the main article. So let me put this a little more clearly. Uh, I've seen cases. Uh, I, I, so I saw a case recently where uh, somebody uh, there was a Facebook post and I saw the Facebook post and the post basically said like it was a post by a female and it was offended by an article that Milo had written. Uh, but all it did was it, it, it didn't like talk specifically about the article. The article talked about it like cited the headline and maybe gave a, gave a link to the article. Now, the headline of this article, <coughs> excuse me, was, um, let me give you the headline, and you can, uh, you can see, and, and there's a more general point to be made here. And so my more general point is I want to emphasize to you that if you come across, uh, be aware 
that Milo a lot of times will intentionally, well, I, I can't say intentionally, I think it's intentional, but he will make a claim or give an article a title which is really like harsh sounding and controversial sounding. But it's when you actually look at the reasoning behind the claim, it might not be as like harsh or controversial as you think it is. And you should, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but by, uh, I need to take one more drink, excuse me. The reason I'm doing this is just to encourage you um, to not, when you hear a catchphrase of his or a headline of his, uh, don't think you know exactly what he's talking about because often his uh, catchphrase or his headline can be a, a bit, can, can seem to a bit maybe misrepresent or not really capture his reasoning he gives behind this catchphrase. Um, so, for example, he has this catchphrase, feminism is cancer, and you might think, like, that's outrageous, uh, but you can't really tell from that statement what his argument is. He actually, th what he does in this, in, this, in this speech where he says feminism and cancer, he makes this extended analogy between feminism and cancer. So if you really want to understand the claim, you should read the speech. Uh, but this article I just want to point out is an article called, and this is the article that my, I saw this Facebook post about. The article itself is, here's why there ought to be a cap on women studying sciences and maths. Again, the title is, here's why there ought to be a cap on women studying sciences and maths. Uh, and I can understand how that would be a controversial claim, and I would understand how that might trigger uh, some people reading it. But I just want to point out that if you actually read the article, uh, what it is not, what he's not doing is just saying like, well, I think women shouldn't, should, should have, should be, there should only be X number of women studying science and math and that's it because I hate women. That's not what the article says. <clears throat> what he does in the article is he gives an argument for why he thinks this would be better for society as a whole. Society as a whole would benefit by this. And <clears throat> the rough, uh, oh my gosh, see this is what happens after a certain amount of time. I'm going to power through this. Okay, I think I'm good. So, the rough argument he gives here is he says, look, there are limited spaces in like colleges, the elite colleges where they teach uh, science and math, there's very limited spaces in their graduate programs and in their programs in general. So, it's a limited resource uh, we have to offer our nation's college students these spaces in these programs. And what he says is that, um, if you look at the statistics, women who begin studying science and math in college are much more likely than men to drop out of the program or uh, start working in the field and drop out of the field. So what he says is that if you mandate, which a lot of schools do, some kind of equality in numbers, if you, if you, if you go out of your way to equalize the numbers in some way between uh, men and women in science and in engineering, uh, science and mathematical fields, what you're going to end up doing is wasting resources because all of these, re these limited resources of, of like college spots at which these people can go and learn about this stuff, uh, a, number of those, uh, a number of those spots will go to women who end up dropping out of the program or dropping out of the work field later in their life, um, that if they went to men, the men would not drop out and the men would keep working in it. And what he's just saying is, his view is that if as a society, what we want is had to, have, to have our educational system in science and math produce the most um, number of people working in these fields because that's what's best for America, to have the most number of people working in these fields, these important fields. He says, if we're going to do that, then we should not mandate that the same number of women as men take these courses and fill up these spots in colleges because that's going to lead to an inefficient allocation of resources. We will be wasting a number of spots on women who ended up not using that education they got, either because they dropped out after a couple years in the program or because they dropped out of the field. So that's an argument he gives. He's not saying like, hey, let's just you know, restrict the number of women in these fields uh, in colleges because I don't like them. He thinks, one reason he thinks is that because way more men, women drop out of these fields more and, they, and, and it leads to an inefficient allocation of resources and it's worse for overall society in the long run if uh, we're educating a lot of people, more people who don't drop out of the, we're educating more people who drop out of these fields when we could be educating more people who uh, stay in these fields. And another thing he says, uh, another reason he gives for this claim that he, he, remember the argument of this paper is he wants to, uh, it's called, 
why there ought to be a cap on women studying sciences and math. And another thing he says is that he believes that women and men genuinely themselves gravitate freely towards different fields. They don't like all studying the same fields. And he believes that women genuinely, if given a free choice, uh, don't as much as men choose to study sciences and math. And he and, and uh, math, he uses math because I believe that's the British term, so I'll say science and math. And he says that there's evidence that this is the case. So he points out, he says, in Norway and Sweden, according to Milo, uh, these, are, these are countries in which women are, you know, they're very progressive and very pro-woman, but also uh, there are countries where women, they don't try to enforce, uh, you know, how many people of each gender are taking certain courses. And he says, according to him, uh, the percentage of women studying science and math in Norway and Sweden, according to Milo is in the single digits of these fields. And he says that that shows that if women were left to their own to choose freely and not be encouraged by like, you know, institutional encouragement to go into certain fields, if women were left to, to choose freely, that's about the number of women who would choose um, science and math fields. So when he says there should be a cap at, you know, women should be the number of women studying science and math should be capped, he thinks, well, if it's capped, what, what will happen is basically he thinks if we let women really choose freely what they want to study, uh, that will work itself out and it'll work itself out to a smaller than half percentage of women studying science and math, significantly smaller, and we should not try to redress that. We should not try to fix it by raising the number of women in these fields. A, because it's worse for society in the long run because more women than men drop out, and B, because women have shown they really don't want to do this in equal number as men. These are his arguments. And my point is just this about that, is that, remember, if you just read the original title, Why There Ought to Be a Cap on Women Studying Sciences and Maths, you might just think, well, he thinks that because he hates women or he thinks women are stupid, and he doesn't think those things. The reason he gives different reasons, and the reasons he gives is he thinks it'll be better for society in terms of the amount of people actually staying in these fields, and also because uh, women actually genuinely prefer to not study that as much as men. So I would my, the, the, one of the things I'll leave you with here is I just would encourage you with Milo and with people in general. Uh, if you hear a quick sound bite or you hear a headline, this really applies to like anybody's, uh, anybody, any thinker, what they think, any theorist. Uh, try to get the arguments behind. And I will say this, I do, I will say, if I can editorialize a little bit, I think Milo in a bit gets in the way of his cause because if I had to guess, I'm simply guessing, I'm guessing that he doesn't mind giving these uh, sometimes saying like saying uh, an intentionally kind of uh, harsh phrase like feminism is cancer or titling his uh, you know article something controversial like here's why there ought to be a cap on winning, women studying sciences and math, and math because that obviously will get more attention so he might be doing it for that reason but if it is I also feel that like if you if you have a phrase like that out there or a title like that out there that might turn some people off and get people angry to a degree that they're not even going to read the actual article. So that's one thing I'll say that uh, he does that could be done differently. And one other thing I should point out about Milo, if I'm going to give a full account of here, uh, as, I, as I finish up here, uh, there is a thing he does, uh, I, I don't want to deny that in terms of, because he is controversial, and there are things he does besides the things I've said that I do think generate some controversy. So that I don't think are that relevant to his arguments. So for example, if you read his speeches about radical feminism, one thing he'll do once in a while is talk about how he thinks radical feminists are not good looking. And I understand how that makes people angry, uh, but that to me is not, I didn't mention that here, because that is not to me part of what his actual argument is. Uh, and it's something I understand pe if people are angry about, but if you look at the kinds of things he actually says, if you look at his speeches, these remarks like that, which I actually think get in the way of his message, uh, remarks like that are not part of his main theory. And uh, so I, I would, if, if somebody says to you, like, uh, if somebody says, like, hey, Milo's a guy who thinks radical feminists are, good, are bad looking, you know, I would just say, and I, I would just say, you know, that's not, that person is not really capturing what his, he's all about. And it's capturing something that he says, but it's not something that he's all about. I, I'll personally say, I, I, you know, I'll put, I don't, dis, I disagree with that statement that he makes. But you know, that's up to him, and that's his personal view, and he has a right to his personal view. But uh, just uh, my best, my what we try to do here is focus on his main views, his main views, 
And uh, so I'm going to recap right now what his main views are. Um, oh, and the one for completion, I'll feel bad if I don't say this, the last thing he says repeat, uh, a bunch of times, and I want to just throw this out there, is he says uh, the, bozzy, the body positivity movement, the movement that says, like, hey, no matter what your body looks like, it's totally cool, the body positivity movement, he would argue that, that it's harmful because it, he thinks obesity is unhealthy for people, and he thinks the body positivity movement, uh, if it actually, it, 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 if, we, if we allowed people to, to actually, he thinks it encourages people to stay obese and, be obese and not get healthier. That's the basic idea. And that if we were more okay with people saying negative things about people's body type, it has a benefit of people getting healthier by getting slimmer. So that's a last point he mentions uh, somewhat frequently that I want to throw out there. So uh, if you've made it through this and you've watched this, I thank you for watching. And I, I really hope this was helpful. Uh, really, to summarize, what we've done here today is we've tried to introduce you to the basic views of Milo Yiannopoulos, an increasingly well-known uh, controversial figure uh, that you're seeing on the news a lot. And I sincerely hope that uh, by this video was easy to understand for you and that it made sense and that whatever you think about Milo, uh, knowing what he thinks, I just hope you now have a better understanding of his actual views and that uh, I would, oh, and I, the, I should ignore, if, and I should say, if you want to know more about his views, I want to give you a few places to look. So these are the articles uh, that I was kind of focused on today. But so uh, let, me, let me read them to you, and you can look these up on the web and read them yourself. So in terms of radical feminism, I would advise you to Google uh, Milo on how feminism hurts men and women. Uh, this is a speech he made, and it's posted on the Breitbart site. It's a transcript of a speech, so you can look at that. If you want to know more about Milo's views on Islam, there's a speech called 10 Things Milo Hates About Islam. So you can Google that and look that up. If you want to know more about Milo's views on Black Lives Matter, uh, there's an article you can look up. There's a bunch of things out there. One thing you can look up is uh, Google Milo Yiannopoulos explains why Black Lives Matter don't matter to Black Lives Matter. And finally, that last article you can look up that I was talking about is Here's Why There Ought to Be a Cap on Women Studying Maths and Sciences and Maths. So uh, this is uh, Steve Luckner. And uh, if you want to ask me any questions about this, uh, I'm happy to discuss them, answer anything, have a conversation with you, uh, leave feedback about this broadcast. I am at Luckner. On, I'm, at, I'm on Twitter at, at L-O-O-K-N-E-R. Uh, I genuinely hope this was helpful for, for you. I genuinely hope this was a, you found this to be a useful use of your time. And, uh, and uh, I would just encourage all of you in the future, uh, as, I do, as I try to do myself, always try to understand people's arguments behind their views on both sides, on both the left and the right. And I think if we do that, that'll be better for us as a country in general. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day. And uh, if it's uh, whatever day you're watching this, uh, keep watching Right Side Broadcasting and stay tuned for the following Right Side Broadcasting shows that are coming up. Whatever they are, I'm pretty confident they're pretty great. So watch them. Have a good day.